Epic, we are celebrating Advent, which means coming or arrival. It's a wonderful time of both anticipation and celebration. It's a time for Christians all across the world to celebrate Christ's arrival into our world through his birth. And it's a time to anticipate a new Christ's future return. So this week our focus is on peace. And this morning we relight the candle of hope and we light the candle of peace. And as we prepare for the coming of Jesus, remember that Jesus is our hope and he is our peace. Please pray with me. God, I thank you that you are the Prince of Peace. In you alone, we find our, our peace. And so we welcome you here today, Lord Jesus, our Prince of Peace. Amen. It is good to see you guys. You ready to hear a word from God? Well, I'm just the mouthpiece, so we need to pray that I will not have any static on the line. Father, thank you for your great love for us, for all that you've done for us. We've come together today to be together, to praise you, and to hear from your word. Lord, thank you for being our peace and for giving us peace and for drawing us into a community of peace. Lord, I pray that you would speak clearly and powerfully to your people. In the name of Jesus, amen. <clears throat> At one point, Chile and Argentina were enemies and fought constantly. But there came a time when they decided that it was in their mutual interest to live in peace. So high upon their natural boundaries, the Andes Mountains, they erected a great statue of Christ with outstretched arms. The inscription below this statue, Christ of the Andes, reads, Sooner shall these mountains crumble into dust than the Argentines and Chileans break the peace sworn at the feet of Christ the Redeemer. Christmas reminds us of the coming of peace to earth. We long for peace, but all too often we're surrounded by conflict. Wars between countries, conflicts between groups, groups of people who hate each other. We might see this in person, we might see this through social media. We know about conflict, it's, it seems to be all around us. And we have these up close and personal situations where they're filled with turmoil. And some of us experience this in our extended families or at work or even among, even among our friends. We're always waking up to war and conflict and turmoil and hatred and anxiety, it seems. This world is seriously broken. At times, we look in the mirror and we see the brokenness of the world. We need peace. And you guys, God isn't dumb. He knows we need peace. And he has provided peace. And that's our focus this morning, second Sunday of Advent. Christ, our peace. So we turn to Luke chapter 2, the familiar Christmas story. And we read how Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the town of Bethlehem, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there with Mary to register. They were pledged to be married, expecting a child, and while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said, don't be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. This is a manger. 
Growing up, when I heard the word manger, I thought this little wooden nativity scene. That's not a manger. A manger is a feeding trough for animals. That was our Lord's first crib. That's where she laid him. To bring us peace, God had to stoop very, very, very low. He humbled himself. God the Son became a human being. It's like us becoming cockroaches times 10 billion. You feel humbled? Jesus, the Son of God, was born in a place where farm animals slept. And He was placed in a feeding trough. The good news is that today a Savior has been born, the angel says. The Messiah, the Lord. Interestingly, these were titles used by the Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus who promoted himself as the Savior of the world. But God is the only true source of peace. We will never, ever find peace through an earthly political leader. Can we just all get that straight? They they can't provide it. It doesn't matter which party, which nation. Some ages may be more peaceful than others, and we can thank God for that. But no human Caesar can provide or decree lasting peace. Our Savior is not a human political ruler of any stripe, but one who would sacrifice himself on a Roman cross to bring us peace. He is the Savior of the world. Notice that Jesus is wrapped in cloths and placed in a stone crib. Luke may be anticipating what will happen to Jesus in three decades. Joseph of Arimathea took Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock, one in which no one had been laid. From birth to death, the same thing is happening to Jesus. For him to bring peace means he's going to have to sacrifice himself in the great battle between God and evil. And he knew this going in. The Prince of Peace brought peace by dying for us. So he began the journey born in a stable, placed in a manger. And he ends the journey crucified on a cross and placed in a rock tomb. But as we know, the story doesn't end there, does it? Peace comes at a great price. That's what I'm saying. It's not cheap. It has to be preserved and cultivated. It was hard won. It's precious. It's worth preserving. Look at what comes next in the Luke story. Suddenly a great company of the angels appeared with the angel, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom His favor rests. This heavenly host is is a term that describes an army of angels. When, when we think of angels growing up, this is the image that came to my mind. Cute, cuddly, innocent, you know, heralds of good news. It's interesting that every time angels appear in the Bible, just about, people who see them are scared speechless. They won't be scared by this. They'd want to hug this. Look at verse 9, verse 10. The angel appeared. These are shepherds, you guys. These are, these are construction workers. These are, these are cowboys. These, these are rough people. They're terrified. The angel says, don't be afraid. Now, I googled what angels might look like as warrior angels, but I'm, I'm just not going to go there. Um, you know. But they weren't cute, cuddly, little, soft you know, fuzzy things. They were an army of angels, but this army brings peace. This army sings praises. That tells you about the character of God. Look at the second phrase. On earth, peace, goodwill toward men. That's how the King James translated it, and that's the translation that's come down to us in all of our Christmas songs, on our Christmas cards, Peace on earth, goodwill to men. It 
It would mean that when Jesus came and brought peace, that the whole world would experience that peace. The problem is, our world is not at peace. It's a hot mess. And I wonder if that's really what the angel was telling the shepherds. How is world peace even possible? Well, Hollywood has an answer. Well, I just want to make sure you guys were awake. <laughs> we know the world cannot produce peace. It's impossible. As you read the Bible, one of the things you're going to notice is that this translation, goodwill to men, doesn't show up in any of our modern translations. It's because there are better ways of capturing what the original said. Jesus, through the angels, is not promising that His coming would bring peace on earth goodwill to everybody. Look at all these translations. On earth, peace to those on whom His favor rests. Peace on earth to people He favors. On earth, peace among those with whom He is pleased. Peace among people with whom He is pleased. Peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Now that's a whole different meaning. So you have two basic options here. Either the really, really old translation, on earth peace, goodwill toward men, means peace among all humanity. And that's what we all long for. But that's not what the angel was promising. Here's what the angel was promising. On earth peace to those on whom God's favor rests. Peace among God's people. This is not a promise for the whole world. It's a promise for the church. To those who belong to God through a relationship with Jesus Christ, God says Jesus is coming. His advent makes it possible for people who respond to God's favor, to God's grace, to experience lasting peace, both in yourself internally and in your relationships with each other. God is the only true source of peace. What is peace? The biblical understanding of peace is a lot more than just no war, no conflict. The New Testament idea is drawn from an Old Testament idea, sometimes called shalom. It's a greeting in Israel. If you go on a biblical studies trip, that's how they greet each other. So we transformed it into shalom, y'all. That, that works. Shalom is, well, let me read what I think is the best description of Shalom. Neil Plantinga writes this in his book. The Old Testament prophets dreamed of a new age in which human crookedness would be straightened out, rough places made plain. The foolish would be made wise and the wise humble. They dreamed of a time when deserts would flower, mountains would run with wine, weeping would cease, people would go to sleep without weapons on their laps. People would work in peace and work to fruitful effect. Lambs could lie down with lions. All nature would be fruitful, benign, and filled with wonder upon wonder. All humans would be knit together in brotherhood and sisterhood, and all nature and all humans would look to God, walk with God, lean toward God, delight in God. Shouts of joy and recognition would well up from valleys and seas, from women in streets and men on ships. The webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight is what the Hebrew prophets call shalom. We call it peace. But it means more than just peace of mind or ceasefire between enemies. In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness, delight, 
A rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied and natural gifts fruitfully employed. A state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as its creator and savior opens doors and welcomes the creatures in whom he delights. Shalom, in other words, means the way things ought to be. That is shalom. The way things ought to be. And that is what Jesus makes possible for us and all who will respond to God. That's what Jesus makes possible for Epic Church. When things are crazy at work and people are at each other's throats, backstabbing each other and lying to each other, it's good to know that it doesn't have to be that way here. When things are crazy with friends or extended family, with fighting and turmoil and hurtful words, it's good to know it doesn't have to be that way here. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace to those on whom God's favor rests. Shalom is a gift to us. Epic church and every church that truly follows Jesus Christ is a refuge, a haven of peace. The only question remaining then is how do we live in this peace? How do we experience this peace? Now that we know what it is, this, this, this flourishing and wholeness, this shalom, I just have two, two thoughts for you as we think about how to, how to live in this, how to experience this. The first one, just because we can't ignore this or we, we get off base from the very beginning is this, to experience peace, we need to be rightly related to the God of peace. Paul says to the Ephesians, Jesus is our peace. When Jews and Gentiles who hated one another and were fighting with each other came to Christ, they became unified. They became at peace. Through his death and resurrection, he made enemies into friends, Romans tells us. He created one new family out of these warring factions. Because of what Christ has done, we can have peace with God. So when we become rightly related to God, we become rightly related to a whole family. And that's good. Our relationships can be good and healthy and harmonious. This can happen only when our fundamental identity of life is being rightly related to God is being a child of God, is being in Christ. You see, we, we have all these identities that we deal with all day. Our race is important. They're all important. Our gender is important. Our income's important. Our education level's important. Our vocation's important. All these identities. But the most important identity of all is that we belong to God. We're a child of God. We're in Christ. We're rightly related to God. And if, and if we all share that in common, and it's foundational, then all these other identities won't get in the way. We can celebrate them. We can rejoice in, in our diversity if we're unified and glued together by our relationship with God. This is what allows us to experience peace that the world can't experience. You know why they can't experience it? It's not because God doesn't want them to. It's because there's no one, nothing, that joins them together. Everything separates. What joins us together? And it's available to the whole world. We're not stingy with it. We give it out freely. Is that we can be rightly related to God and that becomes our fundamental identity in life. Before I'm this, 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 and this, I am this, and you are too. Boom. Isn't that great? Ooh, okay. Thought two. Two. We don't create peace. But we do receive it. We cultivate it. We try to preserve it. Jesus said on the night before he went to the cross, at the Last Supper, he said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I don't give it to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be fearful. 
My peace I give to you, he told them. And they were all on their phones and didn't hear a word he said. Jesus creates peace. Jesus gives peace. We don't earn peace. We don't manufacture peace. It's his peace that we enjoy. But we do have to receive it, which means we have to slow down long enough to experience it. Three boys in our family. My mom would cook the meal, put it on the table, and then just shout. And it was like... <clears throat> so here's, here's the, the follow-up analogy to that. Friends, the food is on the table, but we have to sit down long enough to eat it. We do this by thinking about life the way God does, by setting our minds on the things of the Spirit. Paul tells the Romans, the mindset of the flesh is death. The mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. We have to slow down long enough to be covered by shalom and, and renewed in shalom. And it takes time and it takes a little bit of solitude and it takes a listening ear. We have to hear over and over and over that Jesus creates peace and gives peace. I love what he told, Paul told the, the Philippian Christians. Don't worry about anything. It's pretty universal. Who are you to say that, Paul? Uh, well, a guy who's been persecuted a whole lot. Had a whole lot to worry about. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, not my peace, God's peace, which surpasses all understanding, it just completely blows your mind, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God's peace takes over as we resist the temptation to worry and we pour out these, these, these concerns to the Lord. They're legitimate. Just, just, just tell God everything. God's peace just swoops in and covers us and then stands guard over us like, like centuries. Centuries. Yeah, not centuries. Paul tells the Colossians, let the peace of Christ to which you were called in one body rule your hearts. I think this happens to us as individuals, but also happens in relationship to each other. Again, we don't create peace, but we do cultivate it. We preserve it. Paul told the Romans in another place, let us pursue what promotes peace and what builds up one another. And I think that's how you do that. I think that's what promotes peace. Whatever builds up Epic Church. That should be our guide. Before we say anything or post anything, here's a question. How will this affect the body of Christ? Man. That would change some of what I've posted. You know? How will this affect the body of Christ? James talks about cultivating peace. Peter talks about seeking peace and pursuing it. Jesus pronouncing a, pronounces a blessing on those who nurture peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called the children of God. Australian New Testament scholar Leon Morris puts it this way. Christians should never take the initiative in disturbing the peace. We should never be the ones to throw gasoline on the fire. In an odd way, spiritually speaking, peace is worth fighting for. Peace is worth cultivating and preserving and treasuring. It is the peace of Christ, our Savior. Hard won on the cross. Today, we remember how He first entered our world in humility to bring peace to those who would respond to Him. What an amazing gift. Driving up uh, this morning, Judy and I uh, heard Casting Crown's uh, song, Peace on Earth. It's a really, really cool song. Maybe you've heard Bing Crosby's old 1950s version, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. But I wonder if you've heard the full version of that. A friend recently sent me the full version of what was a poem written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. 
And he, he, he explained the context of this poem. Two years before penning these words, Longfellow's world was turned upside down by the tragic death in a fire of his beloved wife of 18 years. And all the pictures, we see him with this beard. Um, the beard is said to have been grown to cover the scars from the fire. Two years later, he got word that his son had been severely wounded in battle. So you're in 1863, the heart of the Civil War. When things did not appear, they could get any darker. And there was no clear hope for the future. On Christmas Day, he wrote this poem. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar, familiar carols play. And wild and sweet, the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. He only had the traditional translation. And thought how, as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day, a voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then from each black, accursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south. And with the sound, the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. It was as if an earthquake rent the heartstones of a continent and made forlorn the households born of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells, more loud and sweet and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall veil, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. Let's pray. Father, for those who have inner turmoil because of some circumstance, I pray that they would pray like they've never prayed. Hold nothing back. Pour out all concerns to you. And then I pray that your promise would ring true, that your peace would cover their hearts and their minds and then stand guard, not allowing the enemy to get a foothold any longer. Father, for those in our midst who are in relational conflict, thank you that you have made peace possible because our fundamental identity, the thing that joins us together, belonging to you, being your child, being rightly related to you, far outweighs any other identity. So may we speak truth in love to one another. May peace be restored and preserved and cultivated. It was hard won. It's worth fighting for, Lord. Father, now upon this, your church, I pronounce this benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen.